into the first one. Um, everyone grab the Pterodor de Paula in your glass. Um, I'm going to throw a quick little thing up on the shared screen, and we'll jump right into it. Uh, you also have the handouts. Uh, I oh, perfect. Yeah, so everyone should have some handouts as well. Um, and we'll just give you a little visual context. So this is Pterodor de Paula's Falangina Edipina. Um, so this is coming from the region of Campania, the region of Naples. Um, and basically, Falangina is one of the most planted varietals you'll find there. Um, and it's been there for years and years and years, which is really something we're going to see with all the wines we're talking about tonight. Um, and that's really sort of one of the core parts of Southern Italy, uh, is that these grapes and these winemaking traditions have been established there um, for thousands of years. And that's no hyperbole. I mean, really over 2,500 years. Um, the Falangina that we're starting with, um, like a lot of the other ones we're going to see tonight, is actually a Greek grape because really when you start talking about Southern Italy, um, you don't talk about the Romans as much as you're talking about the Greeks before you get into the Romans, because Southern Italy for the longest time um, was a Greek settlement more than anything else. Naples was founded by the Greeks. Um, the Falangina here um, that you're finding, I mean, this is to me one of the most quintessential companion wines. When we start thinking about Naples, we start thinking about the Amalfi Coast, um, all that fresh seafood, all the oysters, clam, shrimp, uh, fresh fish, whatever have you, Falangina is tailor-made to that. I don't think you get a more, uh, more perfect pairing right there. Um, basically, when you guys have the idea of a town like Positano or one of the Amalfi Coasts in mind, you have that sort of beautiful shore with the black volcanic beach, and then those green hills going up right behind it. You have sort of the cliffs going right into the ocean. Um, what I want you to imagine for this wine, and take a look at that picture that you see right there, is if you went past those hills, if you drove up into those hills, um, you'd hit all these sort of rolling vineyard sites, um, and that's the area of Repina, and that's where this Falangina comes from. Um, so when you look at it, I mean, these wines are getting this cool saline ocean breeze 24-7, uh, and that just creates this wonderful minerality for the wine. Um, and this wonderful uh, salinity and acidity. Um, Falangina is sort of a weird name, um, and really the, the word comes from phalange, an old Roman term um, for a phalanx, which is basically just the rows of spearmen you'd have in ancient Rome or ancient Greece. Um, and when you look at that picture of the vineyards, that kind of gives you an idea. Farmers would see that, and if you're looking at that from far away, it looks like a row of guys walking through with all spears held aloft. Um, and then it was really the base for a wine uh, today we call Falernian, the Romans called Falernum. Um, and it was one of the most expensive wines of ancient Rome. And the style of Roman wine has changed a little bit to, to the modern day. Um, they sort of throw everything together and ferment it all together, throw it in a clay amphora. Um, it, usually the alcohol percentage would be enough to light a flame to, so it'd be you know, more sort of liquor category um, that we're at today. Um, and then the Romans love to age their wine. You know, there's a story of when Julius Caesar uh, was crowned uh, emperor for the first time. He really sort of wanted to flaunt his prestige. Um, so for the basically the parties going on through Rome, he supplied jugs of Falernian um, that was 120 years old. And that was his sort of, that, that, was the, uh, that was the ancient Roman equivalent of breaking out your, you know, your $200 bo dollar bottle na of Napa Cab or your, uh, your 20 year old Barolo. Back then, you do the 120-year-old amphora of uh, Falernian. Um, the family you guys see over uh, on the left is the Mastro Berardino family. They're the producers of Terradora de Paula. Um, and these guys are really the first family of Campanian winemaking. The family's very, very old. They've been here for almost 500 years. Um, and for the past 250 of those, around the time that our country was formed, um, the, the Mastro Berardinos have been making wine. And they were really the first to turn... Uh, Campania away from just sort of uh, everyday table jug wine um, to something that kind of became known as wine a little bit more understood on the national stage. Um, to really exemplify how, how sort of quintessentially Italian the Mastro Berardinos are, uh, when you guys are, you know, out in the market, there's two Mastro Berardino names. There's a winery called Mastro Berardino and a winery called Terador de Paula, this one here. Um, Basically, the story is you have two brothers. You have uh, Walter and Anselmo Mastro Verdino. Um, and because they're very Italian, back in the late 70s, they got into a fight with each other. They got into a huge, drawn-out, sort of family-splitting fight. 
And naturally, because we lean into the stereotypes in Italy, it was a fight over a woman. Um, eventually, the brothers separated. They went on to start two different businesses. One brother kept the name, Mastro Veradino. One brother kept the vineyards, and he kept the family winery. Walter Mastro Veradino is the brother who kept the name of the family winery. And he renamed the winery Terra Dora di Paolo. Um, basically, the land of Dora di Paolo. Dora was his wife. Paolo was her father. Um, and that's how it got founded from there. So it's a really nice story to come out of a, uh, a sort of loving brotherly argument that wasn't loving at all. Um, today, the Master Veradinos, they're still cousins and they're now they're two of the most prominent families um, in Italian winemaking in Campania. But I always like saying that, you know, these are, the, these are the guys who are here first and the vineyards they have were the vineyards that were here first and the more prominent ones. Okay. Uh, for, what do you guys- for- for a Falangino to achieve like BOC status, what what are what's the criteria for that? So uh, the, cri- the criteria are si- similar to some of the criteria you'll see in other regions. Um, the yields have to be a certain level. Um, the vines have to be a certain age. I will say um, Falangina and Erpina is a little bit more. Um, they're a little bit more lenient on them. So you need old vines, but you don't need ancient vines here. Okay. Even though a lot of producers will have them. Um, you'll actually end up with vines typically about 15 to 20 years okay. um, for the qualifications. But the, the important thing is that the yields have to be low because um, with any wine, that's always the important thing. The fewer grapes a vine is producing, the more concentrated those grapes are going right. to be um, and the more intense in flavor they're going to be. Right. Good. So what does everyone think of the Falangina? Yeah, no, in the chat room, start talking about what you're describing. Yeah, a lot of minerality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, green apple, yeah, right up front. So when you put your nose in that glass, again, depending on how cold your wine is, mine's at room temp. So my travel from the store to here, you know, it came out to room temp. I mean, yeah. and, and John, a quick, okay. John, a quick question. Uh, yeah. Is, is, is Falangina the most indigenous grape, would you say, in this area? Or do they grow, what would you say is the next most commonly grown grape? I, you might have touched on this, but I might You know, I'd say it's definitely one of the most grown indigenous yeah. grapes to the area. I think following this, you have, uh, you have Greco, right. so for Greco di Tufo. Um, yeah. And then you start to get in, you have Fiano as well. Um, all of these are produced by Teradora de Paula. These guys make everything that, uh, every, basically everything you can make down here, they make. Um, yes. But I would say really your next two are um, Greco and Fiano. And the thing I like about the Falangina is it almost finds a home in between the two because Greco is, uh, to me, Greco is the end of the spectrum in terms of minerality. I mean, you taste yeah. the wine on its palate, it's just lemon juice and chalk and acidity. Yep. Um, and then on the other hand, Fiano is incredibly ripe and rich and almost this waxy golden apple, you know, um, really dark yellow fruited quality to it. And then kind of right in the middle, you have Falangina. Falangina's got that acidity. It's got that minerality. Um, but then it's still got this sort of beautiful yellow tropical fruit. Um, almost I, my sort of one of my uh, cheesy things that I always say with Falangina, but I always go back to it, is that sometimes I get this kind of like roasted pineapple tone um, to them, especially when the wines start to warm up and the acidity and the minerality starts to fade and the fruit really gets a chance to burst. Um, so it's something I like to find. Yeah, a little bit. It's, it's, it's funny because I said I wanted to say pineapple, but I didn't yeah. know how the, the right way to say it. So you hit it right on the head. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, but, I mean, that's that's my favorite thing for wine tasting is the amount of adjectives you add onto a you add onto something. You know, the more if if you really want to go next, you say this is uh, this is roasted, you know, West Hawaii pineapple uh, that was left out on a Tuesday or something. Not dull pineapple. Yeah, no, no, we don't want any of that dull around here. But even what Jason was saying, how do you describe a wine? You don't. You exactly know how to describe a wine. If it, just call out pineapple. I mean, and just as John said, if you really want to get detailed, again, it yeah. just depends on your experience. And it doesn't even have to be about wine experience. It just has to be any kind of experience. Yeah. Really, and that, that's kind of the that. that's kind of the the really fun thing about wine is that it's so uh, it's so subjective to a degree. I mean, everyone has different palates. We've all you know we've all uh, been raised tasting different things. Our 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 palates aren't shaped the same way. Um, you know, so what, what someone will pick out on one wine, another person will pick out something different and neither answer is wrong, you know? Right. Right. I, I, I always tell people, you know, depending on where you traveled, your, your culinary experience, just any kind of experience that you can relate to this, what's in that glass. Again, I've never had a gooseberry, but it's the most popular 
descriptor for New Zealand yeah. coming on long. <laughs> I don't know how many people in the audience tonight have had gooseberries. I mean, I've never found them at Stop It Shop, but maybe they're hidden somewhere. But how do you relate to what a gooseberry tastes like if it's not in your everyday you yeah. know, uh, vernacular? I don't know. But, you know, when you just say pineapple, yeah, a lot of people have, have had pineapple. Uh, roasted pineapple is another layer of flavor, really. Uh, I yeah. love the pineapple, but again, yeah, when you start digging down deep, and again, the more you evolve, this wine evolves in your glass, you're going to taste all these other flavors. So as you're tasting it now, yeah, come back to it in a half hour, see how it really evolved out of that. Um, and the different notes it's throwing off from there. To me, and I read a, I read a bunch of different articles, Janice Robinson describes Falangan, she compares it to uh, Muscadet in the Loire Valley. Yeah. Uh, Melon de Bourguignon. I see similar qualities, but this has a little more weight to it. And I like that about this wine. So for people that like, not saying it's that as weighty as a Chardonnay, but it's definitely got more body than, you know, your typical like Pinot Grigio. Yeah. Uh, or your Sauvignon Blanc. You want to get out of that. You want something with a little more body, a little more kick to it, especially when you're eating weightier foods. You know, you want to go with something like this. And I, th I think you actually hit it right on the point. I mean, this is one of my... Um, my favorite wines to recommend to people who love Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Cause I, I love Sauvignon Blancs and you get wonderful expressions from all over the world. Um, but when I'm trying to take them over to Italy, this is uh, Falanchina is that's, that's totally my gateway. You know, it's, it's one of my gateway wines uh, to get you in. And once you make the convert from Sauvignon Blanc to Falanchina, then we can really start going down the rabbit hole and, and getting weirder and weirder. Um, right. Definitely. Big time. I mean, how far, how far are their vineyards from the ocean? I mean, does this, if these wines are grown at vineyards closer to the water, are you going to see more salinity to this and less? Yeah, water? I mean, I, definitely you'll see them, um, you'll see them closer to it. And actually the, the Greco vineyards that these guys have are right on the water. Um, and that just kind of doubles up their effect of, of the salinity kind of mirroring off the Greco that they already have. Um, the Falangina is a little bit more set back. Um, it's, it's probably about twice the distance. So whereas the Greco... Um, I couldn't tell you in miles, but I could tell you in driving yeah. distance. Yeah. It's like, you know, whereas the Greco is going to be 10, 15 minutes away. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the Falangina is going to be a little bit more towards like 20 minutes. It's 20, 20 plus minutes okay. um, driving. So, so the big question is, why isn't everybody drinking this? I mean, what, yeah. what is, what, what's the roadblock here of why this isn't in everybody's glass on every wine menu out there? Uh, I mean, I think this is, thousand times better than half the Pinot Grigio you see out there on wide menus. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's I mean, part of my job. For... What's that? <laughs> that, that's, 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 Chris, that's, that's yours and mine's and Jason's job is introducing these things to right. people. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, you, you, you know, that's, that's really something, especially when we start talking about um, Southern Italy for wine, uh, you have all these incredibly gorgeous wines that uh, that always kind of fallen under the radar and just the, the, the real sort of, the real mission is just getting people to taste them. And once people have tasted them, you kind of, you have the same thing that you just said. It's how, how does everyone not know this and love this? Right. Um, and that's, that's just been the, you know, that's the job. There's only, the only way to fix it is to get more and more people to try it. Correct, yeah. So what's your go-to pairing with this Falangina? What would you, what would you- I mean, this is just, this is a, a, a cheap and easy one for me. This is just fresh seafood all day. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, shellfish especially. I think it works well with any kind of whitefish, but this is, for me, this is just a sucker for um, shellfish. I mean, oysters definitely, but if I kind of like, because it's got a little bit of weight on it, um, if you ever do like any kind of clams on the half shell, like little necks or top necks on the half shell, um, or even just doing like a big pot of them or a pot of mussels, um, Falangina is, I mean, forget about it. You're, 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 in, you're in a beautiful world there. Right, you're in heaven with that. I mean, I would any, you know, Result, if you want to do, you know, even if you want to get a little bit more full for like a dinner kind of thing, you do a, like a frutti di mare pasta, um, you know, with some lobster, some shrimp, some clams, um, or if you want to do a risotto, even if it's a little colder out, you do a sort of seafood risotto. And yeah. you're right on point for this one. Yeah, this definitely has the weight to hold up to a risotto. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, like something creamy, even, even like simple cheeses, you know, I'm thinking of Pecorino Toscano, something with yep. a little, you know, a cheese with a little salinity to it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely a sheep's milk. Yeah, and this would, I think this would actually work really well with something with some salt component to it. Yeah. It'd be really nice. Yeah. Uh, cool. Victoria saying foods from the air are fantastic. A lot of seafood. Right. So what grows together goes together. Again, think about where, mean, where these wines are being grown and what, what's indigenous to that region, especially if you look into their uh, 
their culinary, their, what they're eating, uh, their cuisine, uh, try to match up with that. I mean, it's, it's going to be key uh, pairing any of these wines. I mean, yeah. Fantastic. This should be, this should be at everybody's glass this summer and right in through the winter. Like you said, you know, you could get away with some cold weather, you know, uh, heftier meals with this. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I think all across the board, I think it's, I, I think always with these, especially with Southern Italy, especially with something like Campania, um, it's easy to always kind of look at them as summer wines because they, it's just such an easy lock and an easy fit. Um, but I love, I mean, me personally, I really love sort of taking things off the, uh, the, the planned ideal. So drinking something like Falanquina in the winter with something a little bit heavier, um, or Greco's or even the Sicilians and the Calab uh, the Calabres we're going to get into later. Right. Doing those in colder weather are very, very cool. Right, right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. I'm actually kind of glad you picked this wine. Um, Piano and Greco, I, they're, not, they're not as eccentric as this, but uh, I think this is a good gateway, getting people into what Campania is all about. Yeah. Uh, and start working their way through it. Again, there's a gateway to everything, you know, even when you start first start getting into wine. Uh, and a lot of people in the audience too, you, what was the first wine you ever drank? I, we, I always tell the story, you know, mine was Vin Rosé from Livingston, really garbage. But, <laughs> you know, it got you in there. Yeah, you know, it's you in. You start tasting around, you build off that, and you keep going, your palate just keeps searching for something different, you know, something really has sparked its interest. Uh, and this is a great gateway to uh, wines from Campania. And from there, if you like this, if you like wines like this, white wines like this, keep going there, see what else Campania has to offer, again, in the way of Fiano, Greco di Tufo, uh, see what else is out there. But even with Falangina, there's just, no matter where it's grown, it's very different, correct? It, it still follows yes. a, a basic stereotype, but it's very different between each each different region within Campania, correct? Yeah, so um, what definitely within Campania, I mean, you have Irpina here, which has a little bit more of that mid-weight body um, that we were talking about before. You go down to Falangina del Sanio, um, which is a little bit further to the south and a little bit closer to the water. That's going to be leaner, um, brighter, a little bit more minerality. Um, and then you actually have um, now Falangina's sort of made its way over um, into other regions because Irpina is really not that far away from Basilicata. Um, so sort of the, uh, the instep of the boot, I guess you'd say. Um, and you're seeing Falangina get planted in there, and that's much, much further from the water. And there you're getting a totally different style of Falangina that's a lot even deeper and riper than this, um, and really making its way uh, to a much more full-bodied style of wine. Okay. Excellent. But Falangina, the, the, the key thing with Falangina is it loves volcanic soil. I yeah. mean, you think about sort of the, uh, you know, the black sand beaches along the Amalfi. This is just straight volcanic soil uh, all the way down. Um, and I mean, every, every grapevine in the world loves volcanic soil. You know, that's, that's sort of one of, the, right. one of the jokes is that it's some of the best soil in the world for um, vines, but for things like Falangina um, and Greco and Fiano, it's, it's outstanding. Excellent. Great. Want to move on to the next one? Certainly. Let's get the... Yeah, for the next one, we're going to do the Rosado. Yes. And I'm just, again, not to... I want to get into the Rosé, but the other night I was having a... I did poached salmon and I had a Santa Barbara Chardonnay with it uh, from another, you know, from a different producer, but uh, just uh, comparing the Falangino with that style of Chardonnay, it was very light, lightly oak, but the body was very similar and the flavors it was throwing off very similar. Uh, yeah. again, for people that they like Chardonnay body, they don't want the oak, they, you know, they don't want the creaminess. They just want nice bright minerality, a little bit of, you know, some acidity to it. Try to hit up a Falangino like this from Terra de Bao. I mean, this is fantastic wine. Really, really a nice lateral move from Chardonnay or anything with a little bit yeah. of into this. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, I think it's totally fun. And I mean, especially riffing off Chard, you, you know, Chard gives you all that beautiful sort of orchard fruit, um, some of that pear, that green apple tone. I think you take some of that and you start making it a little bit more tropical and a little bit brighter. And that brings you right to Falangina as a, uh, an easy transition from that. Uh, so what, I think what we've established with the Falangina is that there's no reason anyone shouldn't uh, shouldn't love this or shouldn't get this. It's it's you know it, it should be the next big thing. It should be Chard Sauvignon Blanc Falangina. Those are your those are your easy three when you go into a restaurant. You know. It should be. It should be right up there. Yeah. And if it's not on their menu, start talking to the people that work there. Say hey, 
You know, I had to yeah. call Agina, you know, a guy Jason, John, get in touch with them, you know? Put it on that <laughs> menu. It's gonna go great. If your seafood, your favorite seafood restaurant is important this why start speaking up. Tell them that you need exactly. to try these wides. You know, get their car, contact Jason or or uh, John, get them in that <laughs> restaurant, get a door open for these guys. Well, please, no, please. no more seafood towers until I get my Falangina. That's, it, that's right. <laughs> that's you know, it. Uh, don't say hey, that. John, Carol was looking for a seafood tower next week for her birthday dinner. John, does, picture, John, does the picture on the front label mean anything specifically to the family that makes it? or is So that... the uh, on the Falangina? Yeah. The yeah so, so these are actually from a um, – so every label that Terador de Paula makes – um, has a different picture. And what these are all from um, is from a 14th century um, actual agricultural guide. Um, so, you know, you, you think of that sort of, uh, you know, Gutenberg Bible Day of sort of monks doing all the, the beautiful hand-painted books. Um, this is this is an excerpt from that. And this particular one um, is talking about actually grapevines. So you don't get much more uh, logical than that. And the coolest thing is, um, I mean, not even limiting it to Campania, but just Italy in general. Uh, so many times when you look at some of those old books from, you know, centuries and centuries ago from the Middle Ages, um, you know, you'll do, they'll do a compare and contrast of, you know, oh, this is what these vines and this is how they made this wine and this is how they're training it. And you look at modern day and you look at some farmer, you know, two miles away, he's doing it the exact same way. Um, there's this really sort of awesome vein of tradition that runs through everything. Excellent. So let's get our rosé in the glass now for everybody. We go to the Ecolossi um, Rosato di Nero d'Avola. So now we're going down to Sicily. Um, this is the Colossi family. That's the, the wonderful family up on the top left over there. Um, these guys are uh, my company's sort of preeminent Sicilian producer. We represent a couple wineries out of Sicily, but these guys... Um, just by virtue of their quality and by virtue of how long we've known them have always kind of been the flagship for us. Um, and now you guys are tasting a very, very new product for them. This is actually the first vintage that this wine's ever been made. Um, this is the first tasting with customers I'm doing on it. We've only been working with it uh, here in Connecticut for just over a month, actually. Um, so you guys are really getting in on the ground floor. I can almost, you know, write you, write you guys off as a research and development stage right now. Uh, for this wine. You can be my focus group for it. Um, basically, the, uh, the, the project for this wine and the reason it's called Et Colossi, um, this is the new organic label from the Colossi family. Um, and the goal here is, I mean, these guys are very old Sicilian winemaking family, and their idea is to put a lot of that back into their winemaking process. So they've been devoting their main production into uh, organic and now this is sort of a side label that's meant to be not just organic but vegan certified and recycled glass for the bottle and recycled cardboard for the boxes and recycled paper for the labels vegetable ink for the labels um, and every single thing that they do is carbon emission neutralized for every truck that leaves the winery there's a tree planted somewhere um, which is a really nice thing that you're seeing especially you know it's really starting to take on um, more so, I mean, you know, when, when we talk about the whole organic discussion of wine, Chris and Jason, I'm sure you guys will agree. Um, we always go to Europe. Uh, the old world is always, by nature, trending more organic than countries in the new world, just from the, the fact that they've been producing wine without the use of chemicals or additives um, for so long that they've never had the need to. Um, and now you're seeing in the past few years, a lot of uh, places are taking that even one step further. Not only are they producing organic, um, but they're actually being actively uh, ecologically responsible um, for their wines, which I think is a great uh, thing because at the end of the day, wine is agriculture and that's the organic movement is always going to be a helpful, um, a helpful movement there. So the Colossi's have a really fun story. That little picture that you guys are looking right there. Um, that's the island of Salina. So when you're looking at Sicily on a map, you look just to the north of uh, Sicily and you have this tiny little group of islands called the Aeolian Islands. Um, and basically each one is basically just a volcano going right down in the Tyrrhenian with a little bit of land all around the sides. Um, what those islands do is basically act as a pressure valve for Mount Etna. The reason Mount Etna doesn't explode catastrophically uh, 
that often because it has exploded <laughs> catastrophically um, is because these islands are acting as sort of pressure valves. They're letting all, they're almost in a constant state of eruption um, and that sort of prevents the, the, the sort of big mama volcano from going nuts. Right. Um, actually, I have a colleague up in Massachusetts who when she visited the Colosi winery um, early last year, about this time last year, they couldn't get closer on the ferry because the island directly next to them uh, had actually the volcano had erupted. And she sent me a video and just sort of black smoke and ash like filtering all through the uh, all through the air as they're sailing up to the island. Um, but these guys, as you'll see here, um, they have vineyards that go right down to the water. Um, I mean, so you're just getting all that terrain air coming in all the time. Now, the vineyards that you'll find for this near to Avalo Rosé come from mainland Sicily or from the main island. They come from uh, right around Messina. Um, when you're looking at the island of Sicily, Messina is the town that's closest to the tip of uh, Calabria, so closest to the tip of the boot. It's sort of the immediate jumping over point um, for it. And it's very, very close to Salina, their island. Um, and they've planted these uh, vineyards over here, very close to the water, both for the near to Avla and for the Catarato, for the white they produce. Um, but the idea is the same as they use on their home island which is, uh, you know, just like we said with um, the Falangina before, they want to capture as much of that breeze coming in off the water as they can. And this really becomes especially true in Sicily because Sicily is so hot, the climate's so hot, and near to Avila as a grape can very, very easily become this big, juicy, round, yeah. um, sort of overripe monster that having that balance and acidity and that balance to the wine um, is really one of the most important things you can do. Um, and all you'll see is just six hours on the skins to produce this rosé. So in those brief six hours that they're uh, soaking, that gives you all the color, all that sort of watermelon, ripe cherry flavor that you'll get out of this wine. So I'm interested to see what you think. Yeah, hey, everybody, start pouring, try it. Yeah, just like John said, uh, Nero the Avalada don't if it's left on that vine too long, especially with the heat down there. It's going to get that big, ripe, juicy flavor to it. I mean, yeah, it's great, especially this time of the year. If you're doing barbecue, it matches really well. With oh, it. yeah. It's a gorgeous. It's, it's an awesome barbecue wine. You do any kind of uh, ribs, even with like yeah. you can. The, the cool thing about a really deep, rich near novel is even if you have something like a Kansas City rub on it um, or even like a heavy St. Louis sauce, it holds right up to it. And there's not a lot of wines that can do that. You know, is Dave out there in the audience? Dave, get on that. Kansas City rub with this, Dave. Put that in the smoke for this weekend. We're going to try it out next week. Yeah, watermelon for sure. Yeah, I got a lot of that last time I tried it. Yeah, strawberry. Yeah, classic with this. What, yeah. what I like most about it is, and I, not that I'm getting tired of it, but it seems like every, especially anything from Provence, it's getting that big, ripe bubblegum note to it. I just want something yep. different. And the other day, Carol and I tasted something. Again, it was just like that bubblegum, and you're like, all right, you know, we need something different, you know, throw in the mix, you know, just really juice it up. Uh, yeah, everybody's saying strawberry, watermelon, yeah. Yeah. Color nice, yeah, dark pink, yeah, yep. They're all, they're all right on point. And that's kind of what I, um, you know, what I love, and I'm, I'm obviously very biased, but I love Italian rosés for that same reason, um, is because um, just by virtue of all the different varietals that you have and all the different areas that you have, you've got this enormous uh, variance in rosé. You can have all these different flavors and all these different styles, um, and you can have so many different kinds. And I, I love the Provençal rosés myself, too, but um, right. there is really something cool about being able to try, you know, a million different shades of pink, I guess, 50 shades of pink. <laughs> right, right. And this is straight Nero Diablo, correct? 100% Nero Diablo, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, why Nero, though? As the Nero, Nero as a, you know, Nero is the primary grape for the Colosi family. It's really the primary grape for Sicily. Um, Nero is the, Nero is the grape that Sicily built its winemaking tradition on, it really built its, uh, built its heritage on. Um, and, you know, these guys really, that's, that's when they decided to make a rosé. They said, you know, if we're going to make a Sicilian rosé, um, there's no other grape to, to really do than Nero d'Avola. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's the, it's the proper, you know, it's the proper grape, it's the proper wine for it. Um, the cool thing is with this as well, it's actually, it's, it's a DOC rosé too. Yeah. 
um, which I find is very, very cool because you really don't run into that. For all the great rosé tradition in Italy, um, most of it is IGT. Most of it is sort of uh, not falling any, under any legal definition. Right. A lot of, a lot of the, uh, especially the Sicilian wines that we're seeing come to market, at least being presented to us, I mean, before, prior to yours, uh, you're <laughs> seeing a lot of IGT status wines. Um, yeah. The last rosé we did uh, a live stream with was with, uh, was with a Sicilian rosé, very in comparison to this, very light. It was more of that Provence style, minus the bubblegum notes to it. Light, yeah. dry, clean, crisp. Uh, this one's got a little more going on, uh, but that was a blend that was narrow, cut with a little bit of Syrah to it from the Planeta family. Yeah. Well, you're seeing Syrah is actually becoming a really uh, popular grape in Sicily. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's actually happening. We have another wine that's produced by the Colosi family um, that's actually, it used to be 100% uh, narrow and they just changed it. Um, the laws in Sicily have changed a little bit. So uh, instead of a lot of narrow blends that you'll see now, you'll see most of the narrow just go into 100% DOC wines. Um, and they've made a new wine um, with a blend of Syrah and Norel Mascalese, another native Sicilian varietal. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely delicious. And it's, it's, it's very cool to see uh, Syrah grown in Sicily because it does so well there. Yeah. And, and as the more you get out there and you talk to other people about wines and their experiences, you know, over the last summer, uh, I talked to a gentleman kind of in your area down in Fairfield County, and he's well versed on Bordeaux, but just yep. a testament to what you're talking about. And I tasted this Bordeaux with him, and he's like, see, there's the problem. He's like, you know, with the weather changing, you know, climate change and everything, it's too hot. And some of these grapes aren't doing well. So Bordeaux was introducing these international varietals to really yeah. try to pull it back on track. He goes, I know the vineyard. Uh, you know, I, I know what the family, I know their, you know, their history. He's like, and what they create. Uh, but he goes, this is what they have to do or they're going to lose tradition. And, you know, I'm not saying Sicily's losing their tradition, but, you know, starting to introduce something like Syrah. I love Syrah. We absolutely love Syrah in the store. I'm kind of curious, really curious to see more of that and what they're going to do with that and how it develops over time. Because as we get I mean, 15 years from now, we could be having a conversation, John. It could be all about Syrah at that point. And oh, so, yeah, you know, it'll, be, it'll be totally different. I mean, that's, that's um, for me, it's, it's a really cool thing to see um, with the industry. I, I mean, and there's certain, there's certain concerns that go along with it on the, on the vigneron's part, on the, the winemaker's parts of, you know, now we have to use these grapes that historically we've never used before. Um, but it is cool because you really are seeing almost an evolution um, of, of the wine industry. The same reason that you're seeing um, a lot of these, these high alpine wines, um, these, you know, these Swiss reds, these Savoie reds, these northern alpine reds, yeah. they're getting deeper and juicier. And, you know, these wines made 15 years ago were, you know, were really green and really lean and really high acid. And today they've got this sort of, um, this wonderful fruit to it. I mean, Montduce um, and some of the, the, a lot of the Swiss ones in particular, um, I think it's, you're, you're in this interesting sort of period where it's, you know, the climate's warmed enough that some of these cold climate things are starting to um, become really gorgeous. And then the idea on the other end is to, to maintain the balance in the already very hot climates, like we're saying with uh, a place like Sicily, um, and how to, how to maintain that going forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a, like anything. It's going to be interesting just to see how the, the world adapts to climate change and how these these uh, winemakers and you know grape growers, vineyards are gonna alter everything. And again, going back to especially Italy, I mean, I know Spain's starting to go through some regulations, yep. especially in Rioja. It, how they're gonna adapt to this? How they're gonna change their classification system and really start taking with everything? Because they're gonna have to. I hate to say yeah. it that way, uh, mm -hmm. but they're gonna have to if they want to keep that tradition going stylistically. Uh, I know speaking with some Spanish wine importers that. They're getting tired of their, their like Rioja, you know, it's, it's getting bastardized as some of these big, bigger producers start going out there and mass marketing it. Uh, are you seeing that with, you know, some of, some of your producers, not that they're mass marketed, but with the same <laughs> attitude say, no, this is Nero Diavolo. This is the way it should be. You know, we, we need to keep it like this. This is our tradition. This is what we're known for. And I always use the analogy of uh, Worcester street pizza as it gets more franchised out there yeah. and the, uh, yeah. There's, a, there's another gentleman on social media that does pizza reviews, and he was down in uh, 
Boca Raton, Florida, and somebody had New Haven style pizza. And he looked at it and he's like, this is nowhere near New Haven style pizza because it, it should be this style, this yeah. category. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know the exact one you're talking about, yeah. actually. Uh, I was, but, um, you know, we, we've seen a little bit of that, not with too many of our producers because a lot of them have, have you know, they're, they're very traditional. Um, but we have seen some uh, start to change the regimen. The, the, the first change that anyone makes, um, and I think it's one of their easiest changes to make, um, is you'll see a lot of them have just changed their schedules, changed their harvest schedules. Okay. You know, if a producer used to, used to do their harvest in late September, early October even, um, they, they'll, they'll have moved that as far forward as late August. Um, and it's sort of learning to, uh, learning to deal with that. Um, and then on, on other ends, I mean, it's just, I think it's amazing to see just, uh, in a larger sense, we have a lot of producers who have, um, changed even in the short term of, you know, maybe they used to use, um, you know, French oak for eight months on their wine, then they're scaling it back because the fruit is so big on the wine now from hotter vintages that they're going for older oak for a shorter period of time or going to something like concrete um, and working to preserve that acidity um, as, the, as, the, as the climate changes and as their, as their, uh, as their harvest changes. All right, excellent. That was great. Yeah. Love that wine. It was a whole new rebranding with the label and everything. Again, switching to that more eco-friendly yeah. design. And I will say too, these guys, um, so we introduced a red from them as well, a straight near to Avila. Um, I, it's, it's like my new favorite jam of the summer. It comes, it, it's in a clear bottle just like this. And it's, it's the first red that I've had that I don't want just to chill on it. I want it fully cold. I want it. I mean, I want it rosé white temperature. Um, it is just, it, it's the, it's chuggable, uh, you know, chuggable red. <laughs> Um, so it's been a cool project from the, uh, from the Colosi folks, um, and they're, they're exciting ones. So I'm glad you, I hope you guys enjoy. Oh, good. Everybody, what does everybody think of it? Put it in your comment section below. Let me know. Let us know as we get into the red. Uh, yeah. red is, as everybody starts pouring the red, finish up on your rosé. Again, any questions on the rosé, uh, please type it into the chat room, uh, or save it till the end. Yeah, amazing. Jason's kind of biased, though. <laughs> but nah he's truthful no he he, he loves it yeah. he knows he loves it he's definitely truthful um the nero de diavola is delicious though the straight nero de diavola like john said oh my god it is very good on, on a little well, then you got to bring it in you yeah stop down with that next time you get around to it that's interesting to try. <laughs> see jason now you have to do now you have to do your job we're talking about how good it is we got to bring it by you got to bring it Chris, by we'll see you tuesday all right it's tuesday <laughs> oh, yeah. there you go you'll see carol tuesday Hey folks, you're seeing that you're seeing the inner workings of the wine industry behind the uh, behind the candelabra here. That, that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, uh, next wine's very interesting, uh, to say the least. And again, this is not something everybody either no. ever heard of it. You never, you know, you, you don't know you what know, it is. For, you can't for, even pay it. No, for every for every uh, hundred people who have had Falangina and every. Uh, 75 people who have had near to Avila. There's about two people who have had Galliopo. Uh, this is, this is one of my favorite wines in the Vias book um, for the sheer, uh, the, the sheer pleasure of showing people something that they've never had before. Yeah. Um, I absolutely, uh, I, I really, really like this wine. Um, so this is Stati's Galliopo. Um, Galliopo is a ancient Greek varietal, just like we were saying before with Falangina. Um, really, when we talk about Calabria down on the toe of the boot, um, we're kind of calling back to a lot of things that we said before. You know, when when, um, when Chris opened up this discussion and he talked about how, you know, Southern Italy, uh, you know, takes up such a small part of the uh, American wine market, but such a large part of the um, Italian-American culture here. I don't think any region uh, embodies that as much as Calabria um, because Calabria probably pound for pound, you see, um, especially in sort of the, the New York, New Haven corridor, you see tons of, uh, you know, Calabrese Americans, uh, you know, Italian Americans of Calabrian descent. And I don't think there's any, there, there's no region as poorly represented in the, um, in the, in the wine market than Calabria. Um, this is probably the, the smallest, um, 
the, you know, the, the smallest influenced uh, region for wine um, that you'll see in America. And there's no, you know, there's really no good reason for that because it's an incredibly large wine producing region. The Calabrians make a ton of wine. They consume a ton of wine. Um, but really the, the major, you know, one of the major problems with this region has always been, it's always been historically one of the poorest regions of Italy. Um, and that did it a lot of uh, disservice and it never had, whereas Campania has a city like Naples, one of the major ports of the world, right. um, a former capital of the kingdom. When, when all of a sudden Italy was the kingdom of uh, Naples, that was the capital. Yep. Um, Calabria never had that. Calabria had, you know, what you see in this picture, these beautiful stretches of coastline along the Tyrrhenian. And then you go inside and you have these wild hills um, with these, you know, these tiny villages scattered around. Um, and really to this day, that, that's what Calabria has. Um, and that's why I love showing something like the Galeopo and I love introducing it to people. Um, the name Galeopo means beautiful foot. If anyone can tell me why, I certainly can't tell you why. That's, that's a question for the ancient Greeks. And maybe that, that they were, you know, they were half an amphora deep on this wine when they started right. naming it. Because I've seen the bunches and it doesn't look anything like a foot. Right. But it certainly doesn't look like a beautiful foot. But we'll go with it. <laughs> um, one, of Cal one of Galeopo's early claim to fame is that in the original Olympics, um, you know, part of the original prizes that you would get, in addition to your sort of, you know, your, your crown of uh, your laurel leaves and your, you know, your acclaim, you get an amphora of Galeopo. Um, which is exactly what you want. If you've just finished, you know, a decathlon or a marathon or any other feat of strength, you want about, you know, uh, 40 gallons of wine. I certainly can't disagree with that. But hopefully you guys tasting this wine will agree. Um, you know, I, there's one thing I, I always kind of like to compare this wine to, and you guys will tell me what you think. Um, I call it Southern Italy's uh, answer to Pinot Noir. Um, yeah, you get that. And I, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of been one of the, you know, when we talk about, you know, how to introduce a Southern Italian wine to people and how to, how to give them their gateway. You know, if uh, Sauvignon Blanc and, you know, un Oak Chardonnay with a Falangina um, gateway wines, for me, Galeopo is the, this is where you take your Pinot Noir drinker. Yeah. Um, okay. It's got all that sort of uh, ripe, juicy cherry fruit and that bright red fruit. Um, and then what I love about it is there's, uh, on the, on the back end, there's earth, there's herb, there's acidity. Um, and that's what tells you it's Italian. That's what tells you it's Southern Italian. Um, and that's kind of one of the most fun things about Italy to me is that, you know, I think more so than any other country on earth, Italy's always got this quintessential acidity and earth and bite on the end of their wines. That'll tell you, you know, if you've got your eyes closed and you're tasting a wine, you don't know where it's from, um, Italian wines always have this really sort of magical way of just making themselves known. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so a uh, spicy finish, peppery finish. Jason's asking, do they oak these at all? No, so this one is not oaked at all. This, this one is 100%, uh, it's actually concrete. So 100% concrete on this wine, uh, but much, much the producers? same. You have, do you find some producers experimenting oaking Galeapo or yeah, no? Yeah, and these guys actually oak it as well. Um, so, uh, basically, you know, there's two major producing areas for, uh, Galeopo. Um, one, when you look down on that little map, one of which is La Mezzia Terme, where this wine is from. Um, and that's sort of on, I suppose you'd call it the laces of the boot. Um, and then on the other side, on the Ionian Sea, on the sort of underfoot, underside of the foot, uh, you have Chiro. And Chiro is really um, the, the one famous wine um, from Calabria. You'll see a couple Chiros in the market. And Chiro is an oaked, um, ch typically Chiros will have a little bit of oak to them um, for the Galeopo. And Stati actually makes a higher end version um, of their Galeopo, uh, a single vineyard that sees about a year in French Barrique. And it's a totally different expression. Uh, it's really fascinating to taste the two alongside each other. Um, that's much more muscle toned um, and big and brawny um, and really sort of intently serious. But honestly, for me, this is the, this is what I want for Galio. Yeah. You know, with, with just that freshness and that brightness, this is a wine you want to throw a little bit of a chill on. Um, when you think of all sort of the, I mean, Calabria is famous for its chilies, for its spicy food. Um, this is something that fits right in with that. You know, even for people who want to go the uh, sort of, uh, you know, fish and red wine route. You do like salmon on the grill with a little bit of spice to it. 
and with the Galliopo with the chill on it, sit out on your deck, that's ideal for me. Oh, Galliopo is actually a cross between two different grapes, correct? Sanjo and Norello? Yep. Uh, so Sangiovese and Mantonico. Mantonico Bianco. Okay. Okay. Is the other grape. And that's um, so Mantonico is actually a white grape um, that you'll find here. Stati produces a Mantonico. Um, and it's a really interesting white, actually. It's very, uh, it's very deep. It's very deep and sort of uh, ripe and really sort of a luscious style. A total, a total side apart from the Falangina that we had before. Um, but Sangiovese is one of its, uh, is one of its parents. Sangiovese has that sort of element of being like the, 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 the grandfather of Italian grapes. No matter where you go, Sangiovese always finds its way into the situation somewhere. <laughs> You get that dusty, that fruit, that dusty raspberry fruit, that tobacco. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. But it's nice. The body of it, it's nice and soft. Even the tannin, yeah. very soft. You know, a nice acidity through it. One of the really interesting things about Galliopo is um, genetically is a great, the, uh, the sort of the tannins are really, and the, um, the anthiocins, which sort of hold all the color and hold all the tannin. Uh, chemically in this grape, they're really unstable. This is a whole a academic discussion that's well above my pay grade. Um, but what I do know in this grape is that it, um, they break down very, very quickly. So you'll okay. see a lot of, uh, a lot of Chiros, a lot of Galliopolis, even though it has that sort of really bright cherry color now, um, this wine is one of the fastest wines to break down into that brick, that brick red, that brick orange that you'll find with wines that take on age. Um, which for me has always just been a, a sort of interesting thing about it. Once you start getting into the genetics of grapes and the chemical content, you've, you've completely, uh, you've, you've lost me, but I always, I'm always interested in, in, uh, in hearing it. At least. I, I like hearing that, especially from, uh, you know, more experience, you know, my, my elders, the people I look up to in this, in this uh, community of ours, uh, they've been doing it longer than us. And, you know, yeah. hear, hear them drink something that's, X amount of years old and you know tell you the tales of this Nebbiolo they had that's 30 years old and you know yeah. that's what you're saying and that experience and you know even when you're tasting stuff with them and they say hey kid wait till this thing gets to about 20 years old wait till that hits and that experience mm -hmm. you know that that's a trip for me again even though we're immersed in this world you know uh, the four of us uh, even the, the rest of you as you're immersed in this world really you learn from everybody else you come in contact with so as a Jason comes in, as a John comes in and tastes with us, even when Carol and I taste with each other to understand how everybody tastes certain wines and their experience. And if somebody calls out another wine and says, oh, you know, wait till this gets to this age, you know, it, that's a learning experience. And you take that yeah. and you understand it. Um, it's, it's all interesting. You know, you value everything everybody has to say that's constructive, of course. Yeah, I think the most important uh, thing when tasting wine, and, and it, the beauty of it is bouncing things off of people. Yeah. You know, bouncing it just as you're saying, um, because everyone's got it. Everyone brings a different sort of uh, opinion on the wine to the table. A different, you know, people are picking out different notes about the wine, um, and you know, everyone can kind of bounce their uh, bounce their feelings and their thoughts and their knowledge about the wine off of each other. Um, that's what makes it fun. Yeah, and you know what? I, just what you're saying, especially in a group like we you know, we have with our tasting group, with our classes and everything, it's, it's very open, it's constructive, as opposed to people being ridiculed or no, that's not, oh, you should be tasting that. You know, I've been, I've been in those tasting groups and I bowed out of them where people are like, you're out of your mind, that's not what it recently tastes like. I'm like, okay, well, tell me wrong, this is what I'm tasting, you know? And, yeah, you know, yeah, you can't, you know, it's, if, the, if that's what your, your, your palate's picking up, your taste, right. there's no way to, you know, there's, there's no such thing as that being a wrong, uh, Right. a wrong answer you know and the important thing that you touched on was bouncing these things off each other and you know what if, if a large majority of the people are tasting the same thing who's wrong who's to say you're wrong you know this yeah. is what you're all tasting and if, if there's two people that don't we can have a conversation about it. say i i'm still not there yet i'm not tasting those dusty cherry notes okay well all right what are you tasting again bounce ideas off each other that's why i like these zoom classes you know you gather your friends and family around and we're all tasting this and you know you bounce these things off everybody You're like wow i didn't experience that you know jason with the pineapple you know and everything else it's like oh wow all right let me get back into that wine let me see if i can pick that up and to listen to people that's that's one of the things i love about group tastings is to listen to people and be able to go back into that glass and say all right let me see if i could get that flavor out of it let me see where they're coming from and understand them 
and yeah. how they're pacing. That's that's important as a sommelier, as as a wine steward, even as a server in a restaurant. Anybody, if you're dealing with wine, is to listen to your customer, uh, and understand how they're tasting, and try to you know relate to it in some way somehow. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's totally true. That's that's the beauty of it. It really is. This is great wine. I told people to put this in the fridge for like 20 minutes because it's, it's just one of those wines. It does good with a slight chill on it. I think that's exactly, that's exactly what it wants. It's exactly what it needs for this wine. Um, I'm, I'm always biased with, with putting a little bit of a chill on a light bodied red. I'll, I, I love doing that. I really enjoy them like that. And I think the Galliopo um, is one that really works to its benefit. Yeah. Um, like but even Torres, going, whoops, yeah. sorry. Uh, Victoria just pointed out she tastes rosemary. Other people taste green pepper, and with that descriptor, that that's common with. And I I've heard that a lot with Cabernet Franc from different regions, where they taste more herbal notes, and some people taste green bell peppers to it. Yeah, bell pepper especially. That's that's a major uh, that's a major Cab Franc uh, note to it. Um, I think that's cool. And I think that, I think definitely you can pick that out on a wine like this. Big time. Yeah, you do get some herbal notes out of this. Yeah, the rosemary especially. Um, I mean, rosemary is a big one that I get out of this. Even you know, if you want to get into it, even a little bit more of that sage kind of note um, as well. Those are always two things that jump out to me. Um, and I think it just it, it's sort of a you know it, that when you start picking those out, it sort of becomes a mental thing in my head of you know, am I am I smelling rosemary because I smell rosemary, or am I smelling rosemary because I want some I want to eat something that has rosemary in this. <laughs> And I think, honestly, I think that's the beauty of it is you're, you're not only smelling rosemary, it's sort of your brain is already linking up all these connections to it of, right. you know, you already know this is when we talked about sort of what grows together goes together. This smells right. like rosemary. So you want something with rosemary to it and it's just going to make it, uh, it, it makes it perfect. You know, everything just kind of fits into its slot. Right, right, right. Uh, so what would you, what, what's your classic pairing with Galeapo? Uh, so there's actually a couple things that I really like to do with this. Um, first this one, is kind of eccentric. Uh, this is kind of on the far side of being eccentric for people to try. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, trust me, before I started selling this wine, if you would ask me what's my favorite thing to pair with Galliopo, I would have probably gone and seen a doctor. Um, oh, right. <laughs> but, uh, but that having been said, having, you know, having worked with this wine, um, now, and I, this is one I really love playing around with. Um, two of my favorite things to do with this one is for steak. Um, ah. I really, really enjoy, um, doing it, you know, especially with a steak that's got, you know, a cut that's got a little bit of a higher fat content to it. Okay. Um, doing a leaner red, especially in kind of this time of year, you know, as we get into the warmer weather, um, you know, you pull something off the grill, you have this, that's still lean. You throw a little bit of a chill on it and it's got that acidity that cuts through the fat. It does. Um, it really does. Yeah, it? especially if you you know if you've got a steak, you know, especially if you've got some garlic and some rosemary on there to season it, um, I think this works really cool. Yep. Uh, the other one that's actually it actually works really well, as strange as it may sound. Um, this was a killer Thanksgiving wine. I had this on my table for Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, absolutely. And it it was really uh, it it really did the job very nicely. You know, we, um, in my house, we do our, the stuffing that we do for the turkey is a sage and sausage stuffing. Good. And, okay. you know, you have Galliopo up against that. It's, it's perfect, you know? No, you have the herbal notes that complements yeah. everything on the Thanksgiving table. You have the fruit component that you need for that dry turkey. Not, not that everybody's turkey comes out bone dry, but turkey's a drier meat. <laughs> they always <laughs> inevitably do, everyone. Right. <laughs> Right, and it's got that great acidity in it that's going to bring out a lot of flavors and all the different fatty components of all the food. Uh, yep. And, you know, again, when people, and I wanted to make the analogy between this, this particular one and like a Cru Beaujolais. Yep. And I'm, I'm trying to find this, like some Galliopos I've had have been more of that fruit forward type. But yeah. This one's got so much, so much going on. It's got better structure, better components to it that I'm really enjoying. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out which crew that this is actually more like. Uh, but again, just like you said, going back to like a Pinot Noir, yeah, this has more Pinot Noir style to it than that. Uh, really fantastic Why I could see this on a Thanksgiving Day table just because of that, just what you were saying. It's good that you pointed that out. 
Yeah, it was, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a cool one to do. Bring something completely different for Thanksgiving. Who's ever had Galliopo for Thanksgiving before? It's two, two at the farthest regions we can have apart, Calabria and, uh, Calabria and, and rural New England. Right. Um, but yeah, it works. Oregon Pino. Jason saying Oregon Pino. Yeah, that's there you go. that style. It's not that, although there are some California producers that do this and they're like tried and true Pino makers. A lot of Carneros, yeah. A yeah, they're Carneros. hard to find. People like P Pinot producers like this are hard to find. Yeah. Um, the, weight, the weight on the palate seems like a lot like an Oregon Pinot Noir, but yeah. then you get a lot of the other earthier herbal notes where you're getting from Calabria. And this producer has been doing it for so long. These, these roots are probably not young. They're probably very old. So now these are, I mean, these are about, you know, uh, 35 towards 40 years old. And these are the youngest vines that they have. <laughs> and that's a lot of history. <laughs> yeah, no, really. exactly. Um, and I always like adding on with these guys, you know, as, as awesome as we like this wine, you know, as awesome as this wine is and as great a job that they do it, uh, the winery is the total side project for the Stati brothers. Um, their main, uh, their main production is olive oil. These guys are the largest exactly. olive oil producers. They own more olive trees in, uh, Calabria than any other, uh, than any other family. And Calabria is one of the major, uh, one of the major regions for these ancient, you know, century old, uh, olive groves. Um, mm -hmm. these guys actually sent a few months ago after the harvest, they sent, uh, to my company, to Vias in New York, they sent us, uh, uh, 60 bottles of their Novello olive oil, which is the first pressing uh, fresh olive oil. It's emerald green in color. It's thick as a smoothie when you look at it. You can't see through the bottle. They you sent us a bite. Yeah, well, you know, so the funny story is they sent us one for they sent us one for every single one of us, um, and we have about 20 people in the office, and somehow the 20 people in the office all went home with three bottles each. Ah, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that works. But I would imagine it was fantastic. Uh, that's, yeah. I love good olive oil. Uh, especially, I, I spent two weeks in uh, Umbria and uh, yeah. we went to an olive grove and, uh, you know, I got some of the best olive oil I've ever had there. So, again, when you're talking that green, emerald green olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, this stuff was spectacular. I had a yeah, really sort of wonderful spice on it. Oh, it's, my gosh. Yeah, this was 20 years ago, and I, I yet to find something that, like, bites you like that. It, there's nothing <laughs> like it. Um, yeah. But I can make a meal just out of great olive oil and, a you know, just a whole loaf of, uh, you know. Uh, really good bread. bread. You know, just eat, yeah. That, that's the meal for me. But, totally. Yeah, no, this, this wine is spectacular. I love this. Again, with the turkey, uh, again, everybody type in comments, what would you have this with? And, you know, I got people already asking me to keep this in stock for November. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping yeah. this. I don't have a Galliapo. I've had other ones. Uh, this one excites me a lot more just because it has more going on. I just, you know, I, again, as we go into tasting yeah, wines, and again, we're getting more critical with our, you know, what we're bringing in, what we're tasting. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's not that straightforward. We're just smacks in the face with fruit. And when I see a vineyard doing that, it's like, why are you doing that? You know, uh, Jason was talking about earlier, you know, Oregon Pinot. I had this Oregon Pinot uh, producer come in one time and they had this offshoot project, the second label they were producing. And they, you know, it was a $16, $17 Pinot Noir from Oregon. And I've had them and uh, I've had others rather that were really good. Uh, and that's exciting for me to see as a retailer to see a really well made Oregon Pinot that showcases, you know, or encompasses what Oregon's about in a nutshell. You know, not super detailed, but again, it, it's like a broad spectrum of what Oregon Pinot is. Uh, this was more Californian style, very fruit forward. And I said to him, uh, I said, this tastes more like California. He's like, yeah, that's what we're going for. I'm like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? You're Oregon. Why would you do that? Why would you go after another style? He goes, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, it's sort of a shame when you see it because the beauty right. of the, the, the world of wine is that you have these uh, unique areas and these, these, um, you know, these unique capabilities. If you have a vineyard and say like Yan Hill Carlton in, in the Willamette Valley, um, for example, you know, if you can make wine like that, which will taste like nowhere else, no other place on earth will the wine taste like you're making it there. Right. You know, why try to imitate another, uh, area? I mean, this is, this is totally a game of individuality with wine. Um, right. and that's what always should be highlighted and celebrated. Right. And that's, that's, when I'm get, getting back to the Galliapo, that's what I like about this. It's, 
we don't see a ton of, I mean, there's a few producers that come in with it. Uh, it's not like that everybody's bombarding us with Galeapo. Uh, but I wish they would. I mean, again, it's one of those really quirky things that you sit there and say, wow, you know, and you like it. it as long as you're passionate about that, you could showcase that to other people that really would enjoy this. Uh, this this is, has more structure. Again, going back to yours, it has more structure. It's just not that smack you in the face fruit, you know, just to appease a broad audience. You know, you really got to get into this and say, yeah. You know, th this isn't for everybody, but it could be, you know, with the right meal, with the right atmosphere, this could be for everybody, you know, it just depends on what you're looking for in, in your stylistic kind of wine. Yeah, it's it's the Galeopo lover's Galeopo. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, I have a question. Yeah. Quick question What's up? Um, yeah, yeah my, my girlfriend had a question. Does, does Stati make any other sort of varietals? Like Colosi does a lot of different varietals. Does Stati also make different varietals or is it strictly just Galeopo? Um, so they do. They do actually make different varietals. Um, they make, uh, so Galeopo is the only red they produce. Um, they also make a, uh, a Greco. The, and Greco, just like we were talking about before, up in Campania, Greco is all over the southern part of Italy because its, it's name means Greek. It was brought there by the Greeks and brought all over, um, brought all, all over the lower half of the boot. So they produce a Greco um, and they produce a uh, Mantonico as well, which as we said, was one of the, actually the parent varietals um, of uh, Galeopo. And then in addition to that, they do a couple blends um, of varietals that you'll find down here. And they do actually a uh, uh, Galeopo blend that's a blend of Galeopo and a varietal called Maliocco. Um, so just to throw as many different weird uh, names in there as you can get. And Maliocco is sort of I mean, that's, that's one that you'll almost never find a, 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 a single varietal uh, Maliocco. Um, but as a, as a wine, it's got a lot of similarities to Galeopo, just a little bit lighter. Uh, I'd love to try a, a, a single style Maliocco one day. That'll be my, you know, that'll be the next one on the lookout for. <laughs> now, do they make a Rosado too or no? Does this uh, they, they've made one that only stays in Italy. Yeah. Um, so just just for the Ita just for the domestic Italian market, um, it's not something we've ever carried. Um, but I I'm sure it's. I think this would be a really fun um, varietal to you to make rosé with, uh, and I've got to imagine that it, it would be just a really cool one yeah. um, to experience. I think it would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had last year we had uh, a Calabrian rosé. And it was still, again, it was a, it was a year, it was a vintage back and uh, really good. It was still holding up really well. Um, and coming into 2020, the, the distributor still had it. I'm like, yeah, you're not, yeah. we're not going to pass off a 2018 this year. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's starting to get tired. I mean, 29, you know, 2019, it was still showing pretty good. Uh, but coming into 2020, I mean, it's getting tired at that point. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the that's the the, the game of rosé. Unfortunately, is you know yeah. they've got their window. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 No, yeah. Just fantastic. Um, Love this wine. Excellent. So great. everybody, everybody's asking for this olive oil now. See, you you open up the can <laughs> like that. Everybody's. Well, I think if if you know maybe if all of us lobby Stati hard enough, we can get some. Uh, we can all get some sent over here. Yeah. If you guys are asking, I can say it's from Market Work. I can you know I can request some from Market Work. Well, we could. Sell, oh I don't God. know. There's some legality with selling that in retailers now. I mean, at least yeah. One there's, it's a little bit of a a, a funny that's, category with that's all that of that gray area. Um, yeah. Again, but you know, I know some reputable cheese shops that would absolutely put that on their uh, shelves. There you uh, go. Especially down at Fairfield or Greenwich, uh, and you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, Those guys, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> again, everybody, before we get to the Q&A portion of this, uh, give John a round of applause. I know you're on mute, but show a round of applause, everybody. And Thank Jason, you, guys. Thank you very much, everybody. Jason and his girlfriend for joining in tonight. Ooh. Great having everybody. John, really, this is great. I'm glad you came in tonight and uh, did this with us. Uh, I'd love to do more with you when you, you, know, you get a chance. Uh, I want to dig deep into your portfolio. I know there's some really great stuff in there. Uh, and I want to explore more of that with you. Uh, and Jason will come around with them and we'll see what we can do with it. Again, it's, it's a matter of finding homes for these wines. You know, they're not, they're not the mass marketed brands out there. Again, no. everybody, you know, smaller companies like 
you know, that John represents, the smaller vineyards, they need homes, they need people, you know, they need exposure. Um, and, you know, John represents some of the best in Italy right now in the VS portfolio mm -hmm. that represents some of the well, best wines out you. there. Uh, and to Chris, get comma, you're, you're the guy to do it. Exclamation point. We try, we try our hardest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, more we, the more we do these classes and, ex, you know, expose people to these wines, you know, that's, that's key. And again, as, as consumers, your job is to go out there, especially into the restaurant world, ask restaurants, hey, I have this. You need to put this on your list, you know, and have them try it, you know, really put them in contact with these people, have them try it. Uh, it's a long shot that they do, but you know what? The more people talk about things, you know, it, it gets into their hands, you know, it sparks some interest. And, you know, for some uh, wine buyers for restaurants, if they haven't tried that particular wine with their cuisine, you know, it might spark their interest and say, wow, that's really good. I got to try this, you know, let's, let's okay. look into this. So everybody, yeah. if you could bring it, uh, type in some questions in the back or unmute yourself one by one and ask John or Jason some questions before we adjourn for tonight. 15. Nobody, everybody's home. No one needs an Uber home, which is about all this. Guys, I'm out. Right. Hey, Carol's out. That's true. Carol's out. Carol's out. I'm out. I'm having birthday cake. Oh, and well, this was so amazing. Can you send me one tomorrow? Thank you, the no, wine I'm out. For... <laughs> I will. Yeah, bring me a slice. I will. Thank you so much. This was great. I will. Thank you for coming and Good spending night. your birthday Happy with birthday, us. Happy birthday, bud. Take Thank care. you very Cheers. much. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Bye-bye. Yeah, Galliopo is my new favorite. Right? No, that's beautiful. What? That's that's what we like to. See. That's the whole idea. This John came from retail too. Yeah, so. yeah. Ret retail is my old job, um, and it's you know the coolest thing about um, even for me transitioning over from retail to this position is you're you're sort of in this uh, this position between the producer and the final customers, which are you guys. Um, and, you know, being able to talk to the producers and, and have them tell the, you know, have them tell you your stories and, um, you know, and talk about why they make this wine the way they do it, you know, the, the history behind it, it's their family's uh, farm, their family style, um, and then getting to go all the way to the end of the line and introduce it to you guys is a really, really uh, great experience um, for me. So. Yeah, Victoria saying I've had Falangino before, uh, this one too, loved it, uh, have had Red Nero Diablo, another favorite. Never had Galeapo. Perfect. Yeah. We're expanding your horizons of Southern Italian varietals. I love it. That's key. And Campania. Campania is just a, a – there's a plethora of wines down there, especially you're talking red wines. To, to oh, yeah. Galeonico, to get – dig deep into Campania and really seek out some of their wines. It's just so interesting. While we're all sitting here, again, when I started off this class, I said, you know, especially in New Haven County, we're all fixated – you know, we're, a lot of us are from Southern Italy, you know, New Haven County is just dominated with Southern Italians, uh, heritage, uh, but we're so fixated on Chianti, Tuscany, you know, to, to try these wines. I mean, even, even going to the other side of the boot from Puglia, try, you know, try Negromaro, you know, try something yeah. different. It, it's, it's amazing. These are amazing wines at a fraction of the price that you would compare with Northern Italian or even domestic wines. You know, it's just a, a fraction of the price. Victoria saying, which is why I miss New Haven. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, to to exactly his point. You know, Jason and I the other day were at a uh, a new restaurant in uh, down on Worcester Street, actually, and, and the 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 owners over there were Italian from Campania. Um, and, and we showed them the uh, the Falangina, and they were like, "Oh, yeah." And yeah, obviously Falangina. We have to have a Falangina. That's that's naturally, you know, it's it's just an immediate, you know, we have Falangina there. We're naturally going to have Falangina here. Which restaurant was that? Uh, it was called Pasta Italiana. Yeah, Pasta Italiana. Yeah. 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 Right. We just haven't listened. So I'll Google it. So, yeah, no, and that's a good place to showcase your wines with his cuisine. Fantastic. Um, yeah. When you talk about somebody that could we went there within the first week they opened, uh, within the few first, few first days that they opened, uh, Valentine's weekend. And they hit every mark. It was fantastic. Service, yeah. food was excellent. I mean, he brought out these, this uh, braised slow-cooked meat sauce. 
it was out of this world. And I, I had to tell him, I said, this tastes like my grandmother's. So yeah. My grandmother used to make this, my, my grandmother was from Calabria. So he made this, this meat sauce stewed. I mean, I don't even know how long he cooked this thing. Next time you go there, ask him about it. I mean, he just simmered this, these short ribs down with onions and it, the most. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I can, my, my, my mouth is watering just from you oh. talking about it. Yeah. Exactly yeah. What you're talking. Need, we're down there right now. Yeah, Chris, where about, is that? When you're talking about Italian American cooking, they nail it. Pasta yeah. uh, Italiana. Pasta Italiana, I think it's called, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where? It's, it's right on Worcester Street, opposite of a Bates Pizzeria. It's on that corner there. I, think, I believe that street's Chestnut. It's across from uh, Zanelli's Pizzeria now. Yep. Correct. There's, there's a dozen pizzerias around there. Yeah, the, you have the little uh, base market right there next to it. Yeah, so Correct, it's yeah. Right, right in the heart of it. Right. But I, I hope to God you get some wines in there. Um, yeah. I'd love to see some of the bigger names. Get. Hey, I'm not trying to knock bigger name wines, but no, of course. You see some of these smaller producers that offer you more than just stereotypical what a Cabernet should taste like, what a Pinot Noir should taste like, what a Chardonnay tastes like. Something with character to it, I think that's key. You get more bang for your buck, and that's that's all what VS offers. I mean, they yeah, offer that's, a tremendous I mean, value that brings back the homeland of where they come, where, where these wines are made from really harkens back to that. And I think that's important, really, really important for these wines. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really our, we, you know, you couldn't sum up our my company's mission statement better. You know, we're... We're an Italian importer owned by Italians. We're based in Italy, um, and really, our our goal is to sort of match uh, match these indigenous Italian wines to these perfect homes uh, on these shores over here, and match them with restaurants um, that they should be shown. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to a great Italian restaurant, a great Southern Italian restaurant, uh, those are the wines that you should have. They're, they not only you know they they work perfectly. Instead of trying to shoehorn something else in, go with you know, go with the natural, uh, the natural pair. Right. Right. Absolutely. And then just, just speaking from a, a distributor standpoint, working with these wines and I, I've met even John's actually brought some of these producers into the market, mm -hmm. uh, just seeing the, the family behind it and seeing a, a family behind the winery, putting their literal blood, sweat and tears behind right. these wines. It shows a real expression of the wine and it shows the real character of Vias, which obviously we, we love to represent and, and show. So uh, just a kudos to them, but also a yeah. kudos to all the winemakers because they truly put their first foot forward when they make these wines. So. No, true, true to that statement Jason just said, in the store, we've done classes over the years uh, with Vias, uh, with John, uh, and again, not, not with John, excuse me. Um, yeah, with my, uh, my, my, my boss. You're with your Big boss, man. Michael. Like, yeah. uh, like we did uh, Vida Romans. Yep. And it was just, it was totally out of left field. Michael called us and said, Hey, you know, she's in town. Would you mind host her? I said, absolutely not. You know, bring her in. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the wines are expensive. Oh yeah. But they, they show tremendously. And there's a few people in the room tonight that were there they tried them, they bought them. And again, it, it wasn't force fed on you to buy these wines to support this, these people. You bought them because they were unique they were delicious, absolutely delicious. And that, yeah. that was the whole thing. And, and to, to try their Pinot Grigio, I mean, I, don't, I forget what the Pinot Grigio retails for now, $35, $40, something like that. Um, it's about $40, $45. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's a hell of a Pinot Grigio, that's for sure. Right, it's unique. And to try something yeah. like that, and you sit back and say, what the hell am I drinking Santa Margarita for? Again, people yeah. that like it, no, no offense, this is a whole nother ball game. And for yeah. the people that were there that night that tried it, they said, wow, what is this? Again, this is this is really artisanal Pinot Grigio made by people, you know, uh, what Jason just said. You meet these people, they're the heart and soul of these vineyards, and you see yeah. them face to face. And you you experience, you live by, you know, you're, you're living vicariously through them when they're in your shop for two hours to talk to you. It's really an experience. And we've had, yeah. we've had a few from you know, from uh, your portfolio that came down and did those tastings with us. And it, it's an experience. You see it in them and, you know, you really gravitate towards those wines because now you have a connection with those people. And it's exactly. It's you know, it's, 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 you have a face behind the label. Um, now, you know, you have a, a person behind, behind the label. It's not just, right. you know, another bottle of wine on your shelf. Um, even, even however great the wine is, it's when you have someone behind it and you know, 
it's like, oh, that's, that's Giuseppe's wine. That's this guy, Giuseppe, who I met, and he makes fantastic wine. And it, it just, it, it takes a whole, it, it adds a whole dimension to it. Um, yeah, and that's really a very fun part of the job. It's got, I mean, it's got to be on your end, too. It's got to be great. Now, how often do you go over there to visit the uh, vineyards and everything? Do you get a chance to go to Italy, too? Uh, yeah, so we, um, you know, in an ideal world, it's, it's every two years. Um, so I was there last year. Uh, I was actually supposed to be there in the midst of all this, but uh, actually supposed to be in Southern Italy. I was supposed to be taking Heart, uh, a, a, some gentleman from Heartland Parker on a tour of Southern Italy yeah. um, last month. But that uh, we would have been at Stati. We, we actually would have been at all the wineries we tasted tonight. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the world had other plans. Yeah. The world, the world dictated to us what was going to happen. Yeah, but the the beautiful thing is, you know, these all these wine regions have been around for about two thousand years. They'll be around for a few more years, so we can uh, everyone has a chance to get over there. That's right. that's definitely. And yeah. where where do you live, John? Um, I'm in Bridgeport, so I'm actually in Black Rock right now. That's right. where I live. Right, right, right. So, uh, not to play favoritism or anything, or put you on the spot, but what's your favorite restaurant in that re that area, of Connecticut? Everybody's got their favorite somewhere. It's not a knock on any of your accounts. It's just this is where I go. No, no, no. That's that's it's actually that's a that's a great question. Um, so I think down here um, we have a couple really good ones. Um, there's one down in Westport um, uh, called Pane e Bene. Um, that's run by an Italian gentleman um, uh, from Liguria up north. Um, oh, wow. He's you know he's a he's a good customer of ours. I do a lot of dinners with him, uh, but I also really do. I think the food's absolutely out of this world. Um, and then you have, I mean, I grew up in Shelton, so, um, you have Il Palio, um, oh, right. and Mar Margarita, the chef at Il Palio. Um, she's another, I mean, she's Piedmontese, um, okay. but, and her, the quality, I think of her food sometimes is, is really, really, um, outstanding. Um, there, there's a lot of great restaurants, man. There, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good places to choose from. You know? What's the name of the place in Shelton? Uh, Il Palio. So uh, P A L I O. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I, I, that's when I worked again. You know, coming you know from New Haven County. When I worked years ago, when I worked in Southington, you know, asking uh, the, the gentleman I worked for out there, where where can we get good Italian out here? He's like nowhere. Bring it from home. Uh, yeah. So talking to other reps again, where they live, where they work, you know, and they've seen you know every corner of the of this state. And again, with our with our uh, uh, customer base here and everybody's coming in from different parts of Connecticut, uh, you know, to hear other restaurants, especially these small restaurants, small family owned restaurants, you know, to give them some spotlight so people could, you know, Hey, if you're ever in this area, go see this restaurant, you know, Apollo yeah. or Shelton or, you know, the other one you mentioned, you know, I think that's, that's crucial right now, especially as the restaurants start to reopen. I think that's that's so essential that we yeah. Get out there's there. there's actually I should I should say this one because I I got it. There's a place in uh, right over in Bridgeport in downtown. Who's another gentleman who's, who's probably one of my best uh, lovers of the Terradora, um, and it's uh, the restaurant's called Avukella, um, and the gentleman's name is uh, Pasquale De Martino. Um, he's from um, he's actually from Sorrento, so he's from right in the heart of Campania. And he's been, you know, he's one of the only restaurants that throughout uh, all of this, you know, sort of crisis when they were shut down, he was still buying my Falangina um, regularly. And I would call him up and I'd be like, Pasquale, what's going on? Are you open? Are you doing like business takeout? What's, and he's like, I'm like, you're, you're still buying, like, thank you for buying it. But I'm just, right. I'm, I'm, I want to make sure you're still doing well. He's like, I'm buying that for my house right now. Right. <laughs> he's like, you know, I'd love to start selling it again, but we're just drinking it. Um, and he is now, he's open for outdoor and indoor and, um, his food is absolutely outstanding. We had about, uh, a nine person party there the other day out on his patio. And it's, it's really wonderful. See, being Italian from Italian heritage and, you know, just from that background, my, my family cooks phenomenal Italian food to go out for more Italian. It has to be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You always hold it to a higher standard. Yeah, you do. You really hold it to a higher standard, you know, and I've been places which were really highly rated and you sit there and you scratch your head like, well, you know, my mother made this last week, it would blow this thing out. But again, you're very critical. My grandmother was the most critical, she was Calabrese. So she was the most thick headed and critical person out there when it came to food. Um, yeah. But, you know, when it's good, it's good. You're talking about the place on Worcester Street, they're good. 
I mean, yeah. it's just like home yeah. style Italian cooking without being, you know, saturated in sauce and garlic and everything else, and you know, uh, yucking it up uh, that some places do uh, to to some of the places you mentioned. Jason, you've been muted. What's one of your favorite places to go? I would say it was, I was going to say Avocello would be one of them because they do everything homemade and hand done. Um, again, he does a lot with the Vias portfolio, but he's yeah. from that area. So everything he does is very authentic. Uh, I'm talking about taking trips to the meat market or the fish market in yeah. New York at 4 a.m. to pick up your, your freshest fish. It's the little things like that that go yeah. really a long way with the whole pairing of the wine. So. Um, really you know, like Chris said, to piggyback off of that, it's it's not saturating your food in salt. It's about tasting what you're trying to order, which is why I don't like my steak when I have steak. I don't like it with anything. And actually, Mike Patrizzo, John's boss, taught me that. I, I don't want my steak with anything. I just want it with salt and pepper because I want to taste what the steak is like to pair it with the galliopo. So it's it's right. it's along those lines. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. I, I'll have to communicate with you guys after this. Uh, there's a restaurant here in New Haven. You guys have to go talk to to get wines in there because I think his cuisine uh, <laughs> with your wines would be spectacular. Ed just pointed out Scapo in New Haven. Scapo's from uh, their family's from uh, Umbria, uh, from Assisi. But uh, if you haven't visited them yet, nice. you know, uh, we will be there. Yeah, yeah. Scapo's Scapo's a uh, one I haven't eaten there yet, and I've heard wonderful things. I I gotta get in the door there. Wonderful people, yeah. all family. Uh, again, now they have their grandkids coming in, and it's just a spectacular family <laughs> restaurant. Again, yeah. they they make family style meals. I have not been to their Valenza <laughs> dinner nights, their wine dinner nights, but I hear they're fantastic. They put out the whole Valenza board. Uh, they're fantastic. Mark Mark is a, is a phenomenal guy. His brother Michael does the wine list. Uh, Yvette does the desserts and everything. They're just they're a great family, really are. Uh, that's another place you guys should get down. But again, I'll text Jason. There's another place I'm thinking of. I'll, I'll tell you to go down and see. Uh, I don't know how big it'll be, but I think his food will really complement. Yeah. Cafe um, Silvium for Victoria, who said that Cafe Silvium is fantastic in Stanford. Anyone who's down in the Stanford area. Yeah. Um, that's another really good one to check out. How's the uh, wine list? It, it's good. It, it's it's a good list. It's uh, you know, I like I, I you know me I asking me that I'm I'm definitely gonna uh, you know <laughs> I'm gonna say right. there's there's uh, there's things I'd love to um, add, but it's 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 a good list. But as somebody that represents a portfolio, again, last year I did the same thing part time. I represented a portfolio here in Connecticut, and to go out into the restaurant world and, you know, sit down with these people, taste with the restaurant tours, taste with some sommeliers, uh, and see where they were coming from, you know, and you, absolutely, you can sit there and they couldn't buy a bottle from you, but to sit there and taste with them, you totally respect them. You understand, you, you understand where they're coming from, especially, especially John, because you work both retail and the other side. Yeah. And, uh, like I've tasted with retailers out there and, you know, when they're crapping on one of my Washington state wines, I'm saying, well, what's better? What do you carry that's better? And he's pointing to the wine. I'm like, come on, really? That one? I'm like, I work retail. Yeah. You're telling me that's better. Come on. How you can't say yeah. that. You know, Restaurants you are a whole, a whole different ball game. And I, I, I love interacting with them. Yeah. Um, they're, they're really great to interact with and they're fun to, um, they're fun to talk about, especially I, I've really found uh, a great uh, back and forth is like, if you ever go to a restaurant with an awesome cocktail program, yeah, yep. not all the time, but most of the time, they'll be really cool to talk to about wine as well. Some some of them are, are more liquor focused and their wine knowledge isn't, you know, they're, they're not as much on that end of it. Um, but for the ones who carry double duty, uh, those are fun because, I mean, you know, they're looking at it almost from a, uh, a spirit taster's perspective, a co a, you know, a mixologist taster's perspective. So they're pulling out completely different things than you would, uh, you know, than you as like a wine drinker would think of. Um, and it's a lot of fun. So good segue because not only does VS do wines, but your grappas. And as soon as you say grappa, people are like, oh my God, right. But your grappas <laughs> are out of this world. Out yeah. Of this world. And your those, those have a really, those have a really special place in my heart. My family's yeah. Northern Italian. So grappa is, uh, 
grappa is the easy bet. You know, we, we've, we've never had a bottle of limoncello in the house. It's always a bottle of grappa in the house. Um, and we have one from a company called Sibona um, in Piemonte. Yeah. Um, and the wine, the, the grappas are uh, totally outstanding. They make grappas that are aged in port barrels, sherry barrels, uh, Madeira barrels. And, you know, for any, um, you know, for any bourbon drink or any scotch drinker out there, anyone who's, a, who's sort of a whiskey connoisseur yep. um, or brandy or cognac connoisseur, um, you know, tasting the, the other side of grappa, not just the, uh, the, the sort of rocket fuel, because there's plenty of that out there too. Um, yeah. It's really, it, it's something. That's the whole experience. As soon as you say grappa, people get that look like, oh, you know, again, it, it's, it's the experience. You've had bad grappa, uh, but to taste with somebody that knows how to taste, and it, again, I'm not putting myself in that category that I'm, I'm an expert in tasting anything, but it took somebody to sit down with me, a grappa expert, and sit there and say, this is how you taste grappa. Really take the time to really taste what it is. And it opened up a whole new world for me. So again, going back to something we mentioned earlier, really learning from somebody else's experience. Again, you you can't know everything, you know, really take in from other people, really value their experiences in this world. Uh, even your Amaros, your Amaros are fantastic. I mean, yeah. I wish I had a market for more Amaro because yours are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. They're, they're really, um, they're really cool. And Amaros especially are just such a fun category. Um, because every one, you know, by definition, it's a different recipe, um, you know, and there's so many different, um, so many different herbs and, and spices and fruit that you could put in an Amaro. Um, and they're so great at highlighting the region that they're from, um, because they're going to use these sort of uh, uh, native styles. So I have two that I represent. Um, one is called Sibona. So one is from Sibona. Um, and the other is, um, the other is called Vignale. Um, and it's from Liguria, so actually the area around Genoa. And they're totally uh, different styles. Um, the Sibona is sort of, if anyone's ever had a Maro Montenegro, um, it's a little bit more similar to that. Uh, it's got a little bit more sweetness. You have gentian herb, you have a little bit of cinnamon in there, um, you know, and a lot of orange peel that really all jump out to you. Whereas on the other hand, the Vignale um, is totally uh, that very northern style Amaro in the sense that it's uh, incredibly bitter. Um, it's got a lot of that really leanness. If anyone's ever had something like Braulio with that almost piney quality to it, um, it's this category of what they call Alpine uh, Amari, um, which are this much more sort of uh, stringent, bitter style. Uh, but to have it in its true sense, its, it's, its original intended sense as a, as a digestif, um, then those you can totally see what you know why they were intended for that because you could you know you could have walked away from a uh, from a five course dinner and you you drink a little bit of that and it totally you know it it, it sets you right it, you know you don't feel like you're about to keel over right right put the names of of the grappa uh, yeah I'll get them to you Ed. No in the chat I'll send them to you um. Well, I, I could go on for another hour with uh, John and Jason, but uh, I don't want to take up too much of their time on a Friday night. Young guys, they want to go out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the going out that we'll be doing now in the midst of all this, but no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, gentlemen, when you're both in New Haven together again, please let me know. Uh, we'll go check out a place and we'll sit down, bring some wine in there and uh, really talk about doing some wine dinners with them. Because I think your wines with their air phenomenal uh the guy is from campania he's from naples so this his cuisine would awesome. knock it out of the park with your wine i really want to showcase the talent of the chef people always ask how do you go into a wine you know a wine dinner it, it's it depends on the chef but most mostly you want to you want to showcase a nice balance uh but you want to showcase the, the talent of that chef in any restaurant yeah. you go to yes, yes. and how yeah. he compare those wines with his food. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, John, next time you're in the neighborhood, let us know. Give us a heads up. Jason, you know, we'll go down there. You know, yeah. after I get out of work, we'll go down there, really talk to him, see what we could do, come up with a dinner, really uh, knock it out of the park with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, when we're down. allowed to, that's the whole thing now. When can we be allowed to do this? But, uh, you know, uh, Again, thank you, John. Thank you, Jason, yeah. for putting this together. Again, everybody. This has been great. Tonight. 
Thank you. Guys, thank you all so much for coming out. Thank, thank you, you so you much. This is wonderful. Of applause, you. Give yourselves thank a round you. of applause for supporting this. Uh, again, uh, we can't keep doing these unless you support this. And everybody in this room tonight, you came, we got a few people came from far away to support this. And I want to thank all of them for doing that. Um, each and every one of you, thank you again. You know, this is incredible. I love doing these because to coordinate this for in store is very difficult. But to do this like this, again, you can invite friends and family over to your house and sit there, open up these wines and really enjoy everything. Uh, Except they won't come into my house. They won't come in. Uh, then, you know, well, from the comfort of your front still yard. Distancing. Then. Right, so put them on your front yard. Put some lawn chairs out there. John, Jason, thank you all again. again Guys, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers to you all. Thank you. Uh, to everybody out in the audience, if you have kids, happy Father's Day to you this weekend. Cheers to you all. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Father's Day. All fathers. Happy Father's Day to you guys. Your parents. Bye bye. Your fathers. Thanks, Cheers, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll talk Here. soon. John, Jason, I'll be in touch with you very soon. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Cheers. Thank you, Chris. Hey, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Jason. Bye. Right, thank you. Everybody clicks off one by one. <laughs> so long. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. So, John, if you're there, uh, yeah. gentleman on State Street in New Haven. Um, thank you. Hold on one sec.